few comments before I start. Restoring mission control. We found a, uh, some 16 millimeter film of the mission control team during the landing. It had never been used because it was not of sufficient quality to match some of the more high-tech productions nowadays. And with the help of Space City Films, basically I've turned this into a silent movie. But I will be discussing and briefing and basically providing a basically running commentary of what was happening during the minutes of the first lunar landing. You know, it's really an uh, incredible opportunity to be here and landing minus one day. Think about this, we're 50 years into this business. I don't feel 50 years older. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a uh, it's real, real great pleasure. It's an honor to be here, an honor to be representing NASA and my mission control teams as I tour the country and basically address and discuss this memorable day, magnificent day in American history. You know, the Apollo 11 landing is ranked among the 10 most world-changing events of the 20th century. Looking back 50 years, it came about as a very unique confluence of events, Cold War, political necessity, presidential commitment, scientific and technological ability, economic prosperity, and a public mood. The 60s was a unique and watershed period in American history. And this year we will celebrate this great event. You know, when President Kennedy made his speech, the Sputnik had been orbiting overhead for about four years. One year prior to his speech, the Russians had sent the first man, Yuri Gagarin, in orbit. And by our estimates, America was behind by at least two years when President Kennedy challenged us not to beat the Russians, but to beat them to the moon. His words, it is time to take longer strides, time for a great American enterprise. Time to achieve the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. For those of us watching and working in the early spaceflight programs, I think he described the challenge we faced because he used the term not because it is easy, but because it is hard. It had a very personal meaning for us. One month prior to the speech, we had blown up our second Atlas rocket. Three weeks prior to the speech, we had launched Alan Shepard. He had a 15-minute flight to 107 miles, and we had a total of 15 minutes in space. We'd never achieved orbit, and we were directed by the president to go to the moon. <laughs> you know, Kennedy's speech ignited the fire in this young mission in London space team. In Project Mercury, we sent John Glenn and three other Americans in orbit, returned them safely. In 1965 and 66, Project Gemini provided the testing ground for the computers and the new technologies of space. We developed the skills to round into the dock and work outside the environment of a spacecraft. In those two years, we sent many international space records, and now we're reaching further, going to the moon. We completed Gemini in 1966 and we transitioned to Apollo with less than a year to the first Apollo launch. And in this case, we reached too far and too fast. We were in mission control for the pre-launch test in December. And then we slipped to 1967. And during a pad test on Friday afternoon, January 27, 1961, the fire exploded in the spacecraft and we listened to the crew's cries of fire, fire, fire. And there was silence. Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee had perished. And we carried the memory of that day forward through every launch pad test, through every mission. And the words tough and competent assured the excellence and drove us forward to the moon. And America didn't wait, uh, waste too much time getting back in business. Apollo 4 in November, the mighty Saturn V took wings. NASA was back in business. 
lunar module we would take to the moon, we flew an unmanned test, Apollo 5. In January 1968, we demonstrated that Grumman built incredibly tough machines, just like they built their naval fighters. This mission, we had a malfunction in the computer. And ground control flew the entire mission profile by ground command. And our final ground command ignited the asset engine. And we burned the fuel depletion, spinning down the reentry in the Pacific. And we had telemetry all the way. This was a real confidence builder for the young team and the astronauts who would fly the spacecraft. Module voice data is now solid, and we monitor the crew configuring the spacecraft for descent. 11 minutes to engine start, six minutes to go, no go. Again, the noise overwhelms communications. My team, precious seconds of data and voice are lost. I think, stay cool. I need that data. If I don't have the data, I will have to wave off the descent to the next and the final revolution. Friday data and static continue, down to nine minutes and still no data. Capcom asked Collins and Columbia to ask Eagle to reacquire with a high gain antenna. The Goldstone and California tracking station report no down lake data. I tell Telcom, try Omni's, go with the lower bit rate. The T minus nine communication data is back. Aldrin reports he didn't know what the problem was. Now the data is solid. We monitor the abort guidance system initialization. Report to the crew, it looks good. The alignment is complete. My flight dynamics officer advises the descent trajectory day is now on channel 22, and I toggle channel 22 so I can monitor the descent. Telemetry and voice communication is solid, and the noise returns. Telemetry and Capcom are battling to restore data. In desperation, I again select the lower data rate. It is decision time. It is my job to assure we have enough data so that if we crash, we will be able to establish the cross. It is my judgment alone. My thoughts at this moment, the spacecraft is in good shape. We're configured for power descent. The crew and my team is ready. The lens system looks good. The only problem is calm. And we have the next five minutes to find a solution. And then I have the option to begin the descent, continue to five minutes to troubleshoot calm before I would need to abort. I believe the calm was a pointing problem that we can solve. I decide to commit to the descent. It's 102.28, mission elapsed time. I pull my team, they all go. The energy in their voices signals confidence. I say, Capcom, we are go for power descent. Capcom says, Eagle, if you can read, you're go for power descent. Capcom then advises Collins Columbia to pass the go to the crew. Throughout the noise, I can hear the Eagle's response, there go. Final reports, the data is back in. There are two computers in the limb. The abort guidance system is a backup to the lunar module primary guidance system. We advise the crew to confirm the systems have gone through their primary alignments. And during power, they sent the limb computer. We'll ex sequentially execute three different programs. The braking phase to slow us down, the approach phase, and then the landing phase. Program 63, the braking phase reduces the orbital velocity. And during this period, the crew is oriented feet forward, face down. And they're basically tracking the lunar landing marks to determine if we're in the proper path for descent. After I've given the go for ignition, I have an agonizing, agonizing few minutes and pray that nothing will make us know to go. I got a bunch of problems, all are related to calm. But I organized my F console and I put the ashtray in the corner, moved near the coffee cups. We give the crew a time hack, two, two hours, two minutes, 30 minutes till engine ignition. Fido advises the trajectory is a bit low, no problem. Com again drops out. We call Collins to have CSM. Uh, actually, uh, we have him tell the crew they go for power descent. Procedures verifies. Battle short, doors locked, all recorders at flight speed. From now on, it's just my team and the crew. No one else exists. T minus one minute. Lem control indicates we're in burn attitude. Engine has been armed. There's total silence in the room. No one is moving. All are intensely scouting their displays for anything that would no-go the descent. Nervously, I pull my system guys. There go, I mentally review. There are two rules for engine start. If there is no auto all engine, start command, slip the descent, one revolution. If you get auto all engine, start the engine manually. 103.33.04 MAT at minus 7.5 seconds, all these begins. At minus 5 seconds, the computer flashes a go request to the crew. T0. Aldrin keys proceed. The descent engine thrust is 10%. Armstrong does not feel the acceleration. 
Twenty seconds later, the engine throttles up to 40% thrust. The computer is now steering to a stored surface range condition to the landing site. Lem control reports engine and arm, all these 10% throttle, all 40%, all are go. We are now committed. Now sustain static and obliterates crew voice in my communications and mission control. Telecom advises Capcom, my vehicle uses Omni antennas. Noise continues just as the engines start. The noise is so great I can't hear my own people. Hands over the heads, every member of my team is straining to extract the crew's words from the background noise. Capcom and telling me to fight to restart comm, I revert to the Omnis again. The Omnis provide 180 degrees coverage at a low bit rate. One minute, final reports tracking data is lost. Guidance indicates his data indicated a 20 foot per second residual, probably due to down track error. Final reports the mission control computer has dropped out. They are now restarting. Tracking data is lost. Data has returned. Final reports tracking data systems are go. Controllers, without my request, give me their status. They're all go. The first burst of valid telemetry confirmed the radio velocity error. We're going 20 feet. Radio velocity component uh, error. Continue flying at all with these alarms. Eight minutes, 10,000 feet. The uh, spacecraft system is continuing the high descent rate. My time, my work, I've been ahead of all events. I'm coming up in the Govan, I'll go for landing. We have met all criteria, and I pray that the program alarms don't continue distracting the crew. Nine minutes, without knowing it, a full minute has passed in almost 6,000 feet attitude. Now 3,000 feet, the reestablishing high descent rate about uh, 180 feet per second. Armstrong reports tracking manual control, he designates on the LPDs back to auto. And a few compute uh, comments now from Neil's debriefing related to the final video sequence. At 1,500 feet, Armstrong saw the auto system was taking him just short of a large rocky crater and a large boulder field with rocks two to three meters in size. He felt he could not land short of that crater, so he decides to fly over the crater. From now on, if there is a major problem, Neil must try to land and abort. He's in what we call the dead man's area. At 200 feet, Neil knows there is a transparent sheet of moving dust that makes it hard for him to pick out lateral and downrange velocities, and he has to find large rocks to determine whether he's moving or not, whether he's stable. The LEM fuel gauge is now reading empty. Okay, we have 120 seconds of fuel at 30%. And call-outs to the crew are now for seconds of fuel remaining. There we go. Position two, all flight controllers, 20 seconds to go, no go for landing. Eagle, you're looking great. Okay, all flight controllers, go, no go for landing. Retro. Go. Fido. Go. Guidance. Go. Control. Go. Telcom. Go. GNC. Go. Econ. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Eagle, Houston, you're go for landing. Over. I do understand. Go for landing. 3,000 feet. Shot the arm. 1201. 1201. Roger, 1201 alarm. 1201 alarm. Same time, we're go, flight. We're okay, go. We're go. Same time, we're go. Flight side or right on, real feet, good, Roger. 2,000 feet, into the ag, 47 degrees. Roger. 47 degrees. How's our margin looking, Bob? It looks okay, we're okay. about four and a half. Roger. Eagle looking great, you're go. Roger, 1202, we copy you. How you doing? Pretty tall. We look good here, fine. Alright, how about you, Telcom? Go. Guidance, you happy? Go. Right on. Go. Coming under speed, 21 down, 33 degrees. 100 feet down at 19. 540 feet down at 30, down at 15. Attitude home? Okay, at hold. 100 feet down, three and a half, 47 forward. Hold up. And one and a half, one and a half down. Got the shadow out there. 50 down at two and a half. 19 forward. Okay, Bob, I'll be standing back here calling Charlie. Three and a half down, 220 feet. 15 forward. Up forward, coming down nicely, 200 feet. Four and a half down, five and a half down. 660, six, six and a half down, five and a half down. Nine forward. Low level? Low level. Good. 20 feet. 100 feet, 3.5 down, 9 forward. 5%. On any bike? Okay, 
Okay, 75 feet. Start looking good. Down and half. 60. Roger. Pick forward. 60. 60 seconds. 60 seconds. Lights on. 40 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. 30 feet, two and a half down. Great shadow. Stand half forward. Four forward. Four forward, drifting to the right a little. 30. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Forward, just. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Rocket point. Tranquility, we got the Eagle. I record the landing time in a log. It was 3.17.39 Central Daylight. I let, I let out my breath. I don't know how long I've been holding it. <laughs> then I hear a noise I had never expected. It sends shivers to me as the viewing room behind me explodes literally in cheers, clapping, stomping of the feet. And the program managers, public affairs and headquarters folk behind me are more reserved, but I can hear them shuffling around, letting out their breath. And I say, okay, I'll flight control is stand by. 45 seconds to T1, stay, no stay. My team was solid. But many of the observers in my room had begun to celebrate the landing. I get angry. Because keep that chatter down in this room. Stand by for T1. After landing, there are three stay, no stay decisions. These are points that if there's a problem in the spacecraft, once it's on the surface, we can lift off at two minutes, eight minutes, and two hours after touchdown. And this will allow the lunar module to perform an active rendezvous with the command and service module. Those are critical times. My voice croaks with pride as I call for the T1 stay, no stay. And Reto, stay, Fido, stay, Guidance, stay, Control, stay, Tellony, stay, Surgeon, stay, Capcom, we are stay for T1. Duke advises, Eagle, you are stay for T1. Armstrong responds, Roger, we're pretty busy here. We monitored the lunar module for two hours before we could start our celebration. And we gave the crew the time three stay and handed over now to the EVA team. Six and one half hours later, Neil Armstrong took the first step on the moon to plant the American flag. With my team's job done, we're now just the observers. As Neil and Buzz deployed the flag, we had finally fulfilled our pledge to our dead president, John F. Kennedy, and the crew of Apollo 1, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. Here we go. Three and a half days later, as the crew boarded the carrier, we handed over a mission responsibility to the carrier task force commander. 